Hey gang, and welcome back. Just so you know, you can use the promo code MTGMUDSTA, all caps, one word, at flipsidegaming.com to get 10% off orders $10 or more. You can also use the promo code at Original Magic Art on everything except for paintings. And finally, you can use the code at mtg.multizone.ca to get 10% off of your orders of singles. Using the code will help you save some money and help out the channel at the same time. So, big news, we broke 50k over the last weekend, and Commander 2019 came out. Talk about a double whammy. I just want to say a quick thank you to everyone who tunes in, comments, tweets, retweets, upticks, upvotes, and does anything that frankly supports the channel. As much as it's a celebration for me, it should also be a celebration for you, since without you, I wouldn't be doing this. Today's game features four brand new commanders, and they're actually the pre-cons of the new Commander 2019 set. First up, we've got three new players, with the first being Williams, playing Anya Falconrath. He keeps three swamps, a Coombe Refuge, Ash Barons, Grevin, Predator Captain, and an Aeon Engine. We have the return of Eric, whose first appearance was in this past Monday's game, playing Girid Conclave Exile. He keeps Slice and Twain, Naya Charm, Voice of Many, Momentous Fall, Rogue's Passage, and a Plains. Paul was also new, playing Kadena, Slinking Sorcerer, keeping a Reliquary Tower, a Swamp, an Island, Secret Plans, Den Protector, Ixadron, and Grim Harrisbeck. Last but not least, we have Marco playing Elsha of the Infinite, keeping Refuse to Cooperate, River Kelpie, Evolving Wilds, Island, Highland Lake, Boros Guildgate, and Desperate Ravings. Eric wins the die roll and starts us off. Eric plays a Plains and passes. Williams plays a Swamp, and then pays one to cycle Ash Barons to find a basic of his choice. In the meantime, we move to Paul, who plays a Swamp, and Williams reveals a Mountain. Marco plays a tapped Highland Lake, passing. Eric plays a Naya Panorama, and cracks it to find a basic forest. Williams plays an Akum Refuge, gaining one life as it enters tapped. Paul plays an island and passes. Marco plays an evolving wilds, passing and cracking it. Eric plays a Kazandu refuge, gaining one life as it comes in tapped as well. Williams plays a mountain and casts Anya before passing. Paul plays a Lanoir waste and pays three for a morph creature. He then passes. Marco draws and casts Desperate Ravings to draw two and discard one at random, while Paul double checks what his morph creature does. Eric helps Marco out by picking the card, and Mandate of Peace gets binned. Marco then plays a Boros Guildgate, tapped, and passes to Eric. Eric asks the table if he should deal with Anya because she seems strong, and with the vote being 3 to 1 against Williams, Eric pays 3 to use a Naya Charm and takes Anya out. With the spell in the stack, Williams does tap his commander, discard a swamp, and draws a card. With the spell resolving, Eric then plays a rogue's passage before passing. Williams drops a swamp and passes. Paul plays a forest and casts Cadena. He casts a morph creature face down for free basically, thanks to the reduction, drawing from Cadena's trigger as it enters. At the start of combat, Williams then uses Chaos Warp to shuffle away Cadena. Paul puts the Sorcerer to the command zone, and then shuffles before revealing an assaulting Apex Altisaur. Sadly, he has no creatures to fight, and moving to combat, Paul's first morph creature hits William for two. Marco plays a Dockside Extortionist in his main phase because the fear of a 10-10 dinosaur is real this early in the game. He then plays an island, and passes. Eric plays a Cinder Glade, which comes in untapped due to his two basics, and we see him paying four for a Hate Mirage. Eric has a token copy of the Altasaur and Dockside come in, which triggers his dinos enter the battlefield trigger. He fights everything else first, saving the original Altasaur for last, and effectively wipes the board as Paul's Altasaur hits the token Dockside, and Eric then passes. Williams plays a Swamp and casts Aeon Engine, which comes in tapped. Paul drops a Reliquary Tower and pays 4 for Bounty of the Luxa before passing to Marco. Marco draws and passes. Eric pays 5 in his main phase for Girid, getting a 4-4 Rhino token as it enters. He then passes as Paul gets a closer look at what the commander does. Williams untaps and plays an Evolving Wilds. 5 mana is what he needs for Grevin, 
who's a decent blocker against Girid. Williams then cracks his wild and passes to Paul. Paul draws for turn and resolves his bounty trigger. As he has no counters on the enchantment, he puts a flood counter on it and draws a card. He then plays a tapped opulent palace and pays three for cultivate. He then drops a strionic resonator and announces he'll pass through his phases. Before leaving the second main phase, Williams exiles his Aeon engine, reversing the turn order and making my life a lot harder. Williams draws for turn and casts Soul of Innistrad in his main phase. Moving to combat, Grevin heads at Paul, and William resolves Grevin on attack trigger by sacrificing the soul. This has Grevin gain plus 6 plus 6, loses William's 6 life, and draws William's 6 cards. Paul then takes 11, and in his second main phase, Williams plays a Bloodfell Caves, gaining 1 as it enter tapped. He then passes to Eric. Eric plays a Mountain, and heads to combat. He swings Girid and the Rhino at Paul, and gets to populate the Rhino, which comes in tapped, attacking as well. This has Paul taking 10, two of which is Commander, and in Eric's second main phase, he drops Voice of Many. All of his opponents control fewer creatures than he does, so Eric draws three. He then passes to Marco for what feels like the first time in a while. Marco plays a Command Tower, and pays five to bring out Elsha of the Infinite. He looks at his top card of his library before passing to Paul. Paul pays two to activate his Strionic Resonator, copying the bounty trigger to gain 6 mana for 2 colorless in his main phase. He then uses that mana and taps a swamp to recast Cadena, and then places free morph creature, drawing as it enters. He then passes to Williams. Williams plays a Gyre Sanitarium as his land drop, and taps out for a Meteor Golem, who, much like its namesake, strikes the table and destroys something. Geared is the target, and with that, Williams heads to combat. He swings Grevin at Eric, and sacrifices the golem to lose 3 life, draw 3 cards, and give Grevin plus 3 plus 3. Eric decides to fog the combat step though with Druid's Deliverance, and he populates his Rhino token. With nothing else, Williams heads to discard and passes to Eric. Eric untaps for his turn, and decides to be the bearer of bad news for Paul with a slice in twain on his Stronic Resonator, and Eric draws a card. He then plays a tapped Rugged Highlands, gaining a life as the tap land comes into play. Moving to combat, he swings Team Rhino at Paul. Before moving to blocks though, Paul flashes in a Thought Sponge, who enters and gains 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters because Eric's drawn 2 cards. He blocks only with the Sponge, taking 9 damage, and as the Sponge dies, draws 3 cards. Marco plays a Prairie Streams as his land for turn, and casts Ral's Eric in his main phase. This gives Elsha a prowess trigger, pumping his commander by plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. Marco then upticks Raoul, untapping a land, and forgetting to tap something. He then passes. Paul puts a counter on his bounty, drawing an extra card in his main phase. He then pays two in his main phase for an explorer, drawing a card, and is able to play an extra land for turn, but first he plays an island. Heading to combat, he swings Cadena and the morph creature at Eric. Eric blocks Cadena with his voice, which sounds cooler than saying elf. Kaden and the voice then trade, and Eric takes two from the morph creature. Paul then moves to his post-combat main phase, and casts Exodron. This will turn Elsha and Grevin face down, but leaves Eric's rhinos untouched. Before leaving the end step, Marco uses Purify the Grave to exile Squee from Williams' graveyard. Williams draws and plays Anya again in his main phase. He activates Anya to discard Violent Eruption, paying its madness cost to deal four to one of Eric's rhinos. He gets to untap Anya as he's drawing because the card had madness. Williams then plays a memorial to Folly and passes it to Eric. Eric pays 6 and then 7 as he drops his land for turn, tapping it to cast a Mara Tandris. Heading to combat, Eric's out for blood as the rhinos once more go at Paul. Paul decides to go big or go home and takes the hit to the face, dropping to a dangerously low 2. And with nothing else, he passes. Marco draws, and Eric tries to convince Marco to finish Paul off with Ral's Eric. Marco had already been thinking about it, and with a down tick of his walker, he deals enough damage to take Paul out. Marco then drops a river Kelpie, and he passes to Williams. Williams drops an Obnixilus reignited in his main phase, and uses a minus three to take out Amara. He then resolves a Wildfire Devils, and rolls the die for who it'll target as it enters. He hits Marco, 
who first flashes back to Purify to exile Eric's Amara. Marco then gives Williams the Mandate of Peace, which Williams just decides to leave in exile rather than cast the copy. Marco also realizes he has a draw trigger from the Kelpie, and with nothing else, Williams then passes. Eric brings out a giant Adipage in his main phase before heading to combat. He swings both of his rhinos at the Obnixilis, and Williams lets the walker die as Eric passes to Marco. Marco plays a planes and down ticks Raoul to deal 3 damage to the Hydra. He then pays enough into Devil's Play targeting the Hydra to finish it off. Moving to combat, Marco continues on the offensive by swinging his face down commander at Eric for 2. At the end of turn, Williams discards Bloodhall Priest to Anya, drawing a card and untapping her because it has madness. He taps her again, discarding Anya's Ravager, untapping Anya again, and drawing a card. On Williams' upkeep, he rolls for the Devils and hits himself, exiling Violent Eruption, which he casts to kill another Rhino. He then draws for turn, and plays a Mountain. We then see the brand new Chainer hitting the field, a card I know a lot of people are excited about. He activates Chainer's first ability by discarding a Swamp, and pays the mana to cast Soul of Innistrad from his yard. This triggers Marco's Kelpie, letting him draw a card as the spell is cast. The Soul does gain haste as it enters, but Williams wants to keep it back, and passes. Eric drops an Elemental Bond in his main phase, and then a Garux Pack Leader, really loading up on his draw engines, and he draws from his Bond trigger as the Pack Leader enters. He plays a Blossoming Sands as his land for turn, gaining one life and passing. Marco plays another Plains and casts Soul Ring. He taps it, and then untaps it with Raoul, before tapping it again for an Is It Locket. He uses the Colorless Floating, the Locket, and a Land to flash back Desperate Ravings, drawing first from the Kelpie, and then two more from the spell. He discards a card at random, binning Gerard, which would have probably been nice to have on the field. He then draws Pramacon, and has everyone only able to attack to their left. Marco then swings the face down Elsha at Eric, who blocks the pack leader, putting Elsha back to the command zone. Williams activates Anya in his main phase, discarding a Grave Scrabbler, drawing a card, and untapping his commander. He plays Sanctum of Eternity as his land for turn, and then resolves an Ingarux Wake. The board gets wiped, with Marco's Kelpie coming back from the Persist trigger it has. Williams then realizes he missed his Devil's trigger on the upkeep, and rolls hitting his graveyard. He exiles Chaos Warp, using it on his face down Greven to shuffle the Legendary into his library. Williams then reveals Graven off the top, which is kinda gross, and doubly so because it also has haste from Chainer. He keeps it back though, as he swings the Devil, the Soul, and Chainer at Eric for 13. Eric casts Harmonize in his main phase, drawing three cards, and plays a Forest. He plays a Flame Rush Rider, drawing as it enters from the Bond trigger. Eric then passes. Marco casts Deep Analysis in his main phase, drawing two, and passing. Williams rolls for his Devil Trigger, and gets to target Eric this time. Eric exiles Druid's Deliverance, which Williams is happy to leave in exile. In his main phase, he then discards a Hydran Archive to Chainer's ability, and he casts Anya's Ravager, who sadly gets countered by Marco's Fervent Denial. Williams then taps Anya, discarding a Rakdos Locket, and drawing a card. Moving to combat, Greven and the Soul headed Eric, and Williams sacrifices his Devils, giving Greven plus 2 plus 2, drawing two cards, and losing two life. Eric blocks the soul with his rider, and takes seven from Greven, which rhymes, and that's kinda neat. In his second main phase, paying six mana, he then enchants Marco with Curse of Fool's Wisdom. He then drops an Armillary Sphere, and passes to Eric. Eric draws, and plays a Command Tower. He recasts his commander, gaining a Rhino token as it enters, and drawing from the Bond Tricker. He then casts an Idol of Oblivion, a card which I'd really like to experiment with. As he's created a token this turn, he's able to activate its first ability, and he draws a card. Eric then casts Explore, drawing a card, and playing another Forest before passing. Marco draws, and loses two life, while Williams gains two. He plays an Island, and casts Increasing Devotion to make 5 one, one white humans. And might I add, I really like the lack of frames that they've been doing with the tokens. Marco then makes a bold move, flashing back Deep Analysis, and losing three life from doing so, and he draws one card from the Kelpie, and then two cards from the spell, 
which has him losing six life and giving William six life. We then see a ghostly prison, followed by a bloodthirsty blade. Marco then activates the blade to put it onto the rhino. At the end of turn, Williams activates his sphere to find two basics and puts them to hand. Williams draws for turn and plays a command tower. He activates Anya again, discarding a nightshade assassin. He pays for the madness cost, casting the creature, and he doesn't reveal anything to its enter the battlefield trigger. He then untaps Anya as he draws from her ability. Williams then discards from under the floorboards to Anya, and pays for the madness cost, putting 9 into the X. He gains 9 life and 9 2-2 zombies. Williams then untaps Anya from her ability again, and he then taps her once more, discarding a mountain and drawing a card, but not untapping her sadly. He then passes to Eric. Eric draws and plays a Sungrass Prairie. He heads to combat with a goaded rhino and has to swing it at Williams, who blocks with the soul of Innistrad. With the blockers declared, Eric casts Momentous Fall and then sacrifices the rhino, drawing six cards and gaining four life. In his post-combat main phase, an Angel of Sanctions then comes in and exiles Grevin with its Enter the Battlefield trigger. Eric also draws a card from the Bond. He then has to discard down to seven and he passes to Marco. Marco draws her turn, losing two from Williams' aura, and Williams gains two. Marco then drops a Talarand, and plays a Windscarred Crag, gaining one life as it comes in tapped. Marco then recasts Elsha, and he looks at the top card of his library once his commander's on the field. Williams draws and plays a Swamp. We see Hate Mirage hitting the stack, and he chooses the Angel of Sanctions and Girid. They come in, with Williams gaining a Rhino token from his token copy of Girid entering, and has his angel exile Eric's angel, who returns Grevin. Heading to combat, Williams swings Girid, the angel, and five tokens at Eric. This triggers his copy of Girid, which makes a tapped attacking Rhino going at Eric as well. Before moving to blockers though, Eric uses Beast Within on the token copy of the angel, blowing it up and returning his angel to the field while giving Williams a beast token. The angel then enters, exiling the populated rhino token. He blocks his commander with the token commander and a zombie with the angel taking eight. In his post-combat main phase, Williams then discards Avison's judgment, paying the madness cost and putting ten into the X. Fearing a pump spell, he assigns lethal damage to Girid and the angel to hopefully guarantee their removal and puts the last point onto a human before untapping Anya and drawing a card from her ability. He then passes to Eric. Eric embalms his Angel of Sanctions, bringing a token copy of the creature onto the battlefield and drawing a card from the Bond trigger. The Angel gets to exile a creature, and we say goodbye to Chainer. Eric then drops a Boros Garrison onto the field, returning a land to his hand. We then see the Idol get tapped, drawing Eric a card, and as he passes to Marco, he discards down to seven. Marco draws her turn, losing 2 life and giving Williams 2 life. Marco then casts Factor Fiction off the top of his library thanks to his commander, and has Eric make the piles. Marco takes the pile of 4, bending the gutter snipe, and also gets a 2-2 drake from Talarand. We then see a magma quake where X is 6 hitting the stack. With the spell waiting to resolve, Williams taps Anya to discard a mountain and draw a card. The spell then resolves, wiping away the board, Marco gains another Drake token from Talaran before passing. Williams taps enough in his second main phase to activate the Soul of Innistrad's second ability, exiling it and returning three creature cards to his hand. He brings back Meteor Golem, Grevin, and Anyan's Ravager, putting them to hand. We then see the return of the Meteor Golem, who enters and targets the Angel. Responding to the trigger, Eric uses Rootborn Defenses to give the current Angel indestructible and populates for another one. It enters and exiles the curse from Marco and draws Eric a card. Williams then drops a key to the city and passes. Eric plays a forest and casts Song of the World Soul, and my heart skips a beat. We then see Sakura Tribe Elder, who lets Eric populate from the song's on cast trigger. He makes another angel token, exiling the key and drawing as it enters. He then casts a Selesnya Eulogist and responding to the populate trigger, Marco casts Refuse, dealing three damage to Eric. Eric then gets his fourth angel, exiling the ghostly prison, and drawing another card from the bond. Eric then taps the idol to draw a card, and passes. Marco casts Wall of Stolen Identity, which becomes a copy of the Angel of Sanctions, and it exiles the angel that's exiled his ghostly prison, 
and taps the token copy that it copied. Marco then plays a tap Mystic Monastery before dropping a Crackling Drake and drawing a card as it enters. He then swings his drakes in the air at Williams for 4. In his post-combat main phase, he pays for Sun Titan, and with it entering, brings back Gutter Snipe to the field. Williams draws and plays a Drown Your Temple as his land for turn. He casts my preview card, Skyfire Phoenix in his main phase, and then brings back Grevin, followed by the Ravager. We then see a Sanitarium Skeleton before passing to Eric. At the end of Williams' turn, Eric activates his Eulogist, exiling a creature from Marco's graveyard to populate. He makes another Token Angel, who comes in and exiles the Gutter Snipe and draws Eric a card. Eric then sacrifices the Zelder, finding a basic and moving to his turn. Eric pays 2 in his main phase for Intangible Virtue, but misses the Populate trigger. He then casts Tarngarth, First Mate, and remembers to populate once more thanks to the Soul's trigger. He has another Angel come in, exile on the Sun Titan this time, and draws from the creature entering. We then see a Shamanic Revelation hit the stack, and he resolves the Populate trigger from the Soul. The Angel comes in, exiling Grevin, and draws Eric a card. Before letting his spell resolve, he then casts Second Harvest, getting another Populate trigger from the Soul, and gains another Angel token. It exiles the Drake, draws Eric a card, and then he resolves the Second Harvest, doubling his tokens. This gives him seven more Angel tokens, who all enter and exile seven more non-land permanents, and draw him seven more cards. Eric then resolves the Revelation, and draws 16 cards, and gains four life 15 times. Eric then casts a Soul Ring, gaining another Angel token, who exiles the last Drake. He had five Angels before all the doubling, who all go at Williams. They've all got plus one plus one and Vigilance from the Intangible Virtue, and they deal 20 damage to him. Eric then moves to his end step, and has to discard down to seven. Marco untaps, and draws, playing a Tranquil Cove and gaining one life. He flashes back the Increasing Ambition, and with it on the stack, casts the Aftermath half of Refuse, which is Cooperate, and copies his spell. This gives him 10 human creature tokens twice, and Marco then uses Mystic Retrieval to bring back Factor Fiction to his hand, and he passes. Williams draws and pays 9 for Anya in his main phase. He taps her, discarding Call to the Netherworld, and casts at 0 madness cost. He returns Bloodhall Priest, and untaps and draws with Anya. He then discards the Priest, not paying for a madness cost, but gets to untap with Anya and draw again. He then taps his commander once more, this time discarding Exotic Orchard, and drawing a card. He hasn't found the board wipe that he's looking for, and Williams then taps the rest of his mana for a Flare of the Hatebound, and passes. Eric draws, and casts Dragon Master Outcast, resolving his Populate trigger first, and exiling the Flare. He then casts Lightning Greaves, which populates again, and exiles Anya, who Williams puts to his command zone. Eric then casts Girid's Belligerence, where X is 12, and takes out 12 of Marco's humans, and gets to populate 12 more times, plus 1 from the Song trigger. This has Eric gaining 13 Angel tokens, drawing 13 cards, and exiling basically anything that isn't a land. This is just the icing on the cake though, as he has more than enough Angels to take both Williams and Marco out at the same time as he moves to combat. Game review time! So I have to say, my hat is off to Wizards of the Coast for designing probably the most thematically on-point commander set to date. I know a lot of people were a bit dismissive considering the themes, but I think they really did a great job of making the deck relatively cohesive in comparison to the other ones. At Multizone on the Saturday, we had about six full tables, with one table being exclusively the Celtai deck, which I thought was kind of funny. But everyone seemed to be having a lot of fun. It seemed like the least popular deck was definitely the Jeskai one, and I saw a lot of people playing Elsha as opposed to Savine, which I'm a little bit surprised with. Playing off the top is great, but I think that the deck is built around more of the flashback element, and probably would have functioned better if you read Savine instead of Elsha. Geared certainly proved his worth, and I was a little bit skeptical about only getting Populate when you attack, but the deck seemed slow enough to allow him to go around the table at least once, and basically get at least one Populate before he was removed. I think Eric did a great job of showcasing a lot of the very powerful new Populate cards in the deck, like Song of the World Soul and Selesnya Eulogist. Anya was incredible, and I was so blown away with how much that Williams was able to get out of his deck. Going into this, I probably would have said that Madness had the least amount of cards useful in the deck, but I was shown wrong very quickly as he cycled through them turn after turn, and there were a lot of Madness cards that had recursion built into them, which allowed them to return you to your hand, and then cycle them again with Anya. 
I will say that the Assault Tide deck was unfortunately taken out very early this game, and I think this was because a lot of people were considering it the boogeyman of the set. Not knowing what creatures are on your opponent's side of the battlefield can be very tilting, and considering how useful and how many utility effects they have, you often don't want to leave too many out. I will say that the downside of the Assault Tide deck did seem to be that it was very mana hungry, since as soon as you played one or two morph creatures, you had to leave up a ton of mana in order to flip them and get the most out of them. Please be sure to tune in every Monday and Thursday at 11am Eastern Standard Time for a guaranteed new video. You can also follow me on Twitter at MTGMudsta. You can find me on Facebook at Facebook.com slash MTGMudsta. And lastly, you can check me out when I stream at Twitch.tv slash MTGMudsta. This video is brought to you in support by my patrons. If you're looking for a way to help out the channel, please be sure to visit the link below. Thank you all for watching this video, and don't forget, friends are just opponents you haven't eliminated yet.